Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Nicholas Pope. I'm one of the neurosurgeons uh, in the Department of Neurosurgery here at Cape Cod Hospital. I'm joined uh, by Achilles Papavasilio and Gordon Nakata. And uh, thank you for taking the time uh, uh, to be with us. This is a little bit unconventional for us. Uh, we're actually just looking at cameras. Uh, so we know we have a pretty, pretty large audience. Uh, we want you to kind of bear with us as we go through this. Um, I think it's important to bring up now, if at any point you have questions during the discussion, we actually would prefer that you can type them into the chat when it comes to your mind. This way we can answer them as we progress uh, through the presentation. It's also a good way to break up the monotony uh, of, of talking. Um, the objectives for tonight's talk, I'm gonna go through an introduction and you can see uh, I'm gonna talk about sources of low back pain spend some time on neuroanatomy because I want to teach you um, the language of the problems of, of low back pain. Uh, and it helps foster a more solid understanding to what problems may be uh, that you're experiencing. So anatomy is important. Uh, we'll talk about the evaluation of the chief complaint of low back pain, differential diagnoses, how imaging aids in confirming the diagnosis, and then the two sections of risk assessment and age considerations are particularly important to our population um, uh, here on Cape Cod, uh, simply because we have many patients that uh, are in their 60s, 70s, 80s, and we even see patients in their 90s come to clinic. And then lastly, we'll focus on treatment. Um, when putting this presentation together, uh, I approached it as though I want to teach you something um, that is not superficial. Uh, it may be a little bit complex, but this is how I talk to patients in the clinic. Uh, and I'm gonna share with you what we as doctors are thinking as you're telling us your complaints. So basically a little bit about the practice. Uh, this practice was founded in 1971, so over 50 years uh, in existence. Uh, we're, we have one office at the moment. We're located on North Street in Hyannis. And we're the only group of neurosurgeons practicing uh, on Cape Cod. Uh, there's four of us in total. We have one nurse practitioner, two physician assistants, uh, and uh, office support staff um, uh, that help us render care in the clinic, which is a big part of what we do. And we also do a fair amount, obviously, of work in the hospital, not only operating on elective cases, but we see patients that come in through the emergency room. Um, so the uh, breadth of our practice, I would say, is pretty broad. We also cover services, the neurosurgical services uh, for Falmouth Hospital, uh, and that can be through their emergency room or patients that have been, been admitted to uh, the hospital uh, there in Falmouth. So we're constantly uh, interacting with healthcare uh, providers and physicians across the Cape, trying to deliver the best neurosurgical care that we can. So when encountering a patient with a chief complaint of low back pain, uh, the examining physician, and this is not just the neurosurgeon, any physician has several considerations. Uh, obviously, we wanna preserve neurological function. That should be of utmost importance. Uh, um, the second is we wanna optimize the recovery of neurological function that's been lost. Uh, 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 thirdly, we want to restore spine stability if the problem pertains to the spine. And lastly, um, we want to uh, reduce pain. So it was just brought to my attention that my screen has not been shared. So you did not see any of my slides up to this point. We'll do that now. You can now see my screen and we will go back to play. Okay, so um, uh, I was just saying that these are the goals of the examining physician, preservation of uh, neurological function, optimizing recovery, restoring stability uh, to, sp to the spine, and lastly, reducing pain. So in order to do that, the examining physician has to provide a, a perform a good history. You have to obtain a history, talk to your patient, listen to their symptoms, do a, a detailed physical examination, and you have to localize the problem. You're not gonna be able to treat something until you know precisely what the source uh, of the complaint is. Um, 
you need to be broad in generating your differential diagnosis, which means you have to take in all considerations uh, because you want to treat the right thing. Order the appropriate tests. And lastly, and I, and I think this is a source of frustration for some patients, is you want to put a plan in place, a course of action in a timely manner. Uh, there's nothing than delayed diagnoses uh, uh, and prolonged pain uh, because of that fact. So in general, why is low back pain or why are we talking about low back pain? Uh, well, it's important because it's the most common reason or the second most common reason for people to seek medical attention. Uh, it affects our worst workforce. 15% of sick leave is because of low back pain. Uh, it's the most common cause of disability uh, for people less than 45 years of age and the lifetime prevalence. So if, if you live long enough, 60 to 90 percent of people at some point are going to have low back pain. So it's going to affect basically all of us. What are the sources of low back pain? Uh, well, any structure in the spine can cause pain if it's innervated. Uh, and uh, uh, secondly, uh, a structure can cause pain only really if it can produce a, a clinically identifiable uh, pain syndrome. Any structure in the back that's susceptible to injury can cause pain. And you know, when you think of the anatomy of the spine, we've all heard these words. So what's gonna cause pain? Well, it can come from the bones, the joints, muscles, ligaments, nerves, uh, disc problems can cause pain, and pathology such as cancer. So, the spine in general is broken down to cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and sacral. For the purpose of the discussion uh, today, we're focusing on the lumbosacral spine, so the bottom five lumbar vertebra and the sacrum, which is broken down into five segments. Each vertebra, so the vertebra is the segment or the bone of the spine, and you want to think of that uh, in a similar way as the links of a chain. So the vertebra uh, function um, uh, to uh, encase the neural elements of the spine and provide protection. And they'll consist of, and these words that I'm about to say, you're going to hear them repeatedly throughout the rest of this discussion, but we have a vertebral body, a pedicle, and then a lamina. And if you look at that from both sides, that will form a complete bony ring around the spinal canal. And that's where the nerves travel. The other important part of the anatomy of the vertebra that you want to know or familiar, familiarize yourself with is something called the facet joint, right? We know that bones articulate with one another um, uh, via joints, the knee joint, the hip joint. Well, on the spine, we call that the facet joint, and that's out here. Okay, so this is all normal anatomy. The ligaments of the spine, um, uh, are, are, are structures that are composed of elastin, collagen. These are things or molecules that provide flexibility um, and they attach bone to bone. And these structures are what allows the spine to undergo normal physiologic motion. And they're, they're, the purpose is really protective. But as we age, and you'll see, uh, they can thicken, they can enlarge, uh, and ultimately, that could lead to pathological compression of the nerves traveling uh, through this area. Uh, this is looking at your spine from the side. Uh, and again, you can see the various um, uh, uh, attachment points of these ligaments throughout the lumbosacral spine. We all know or have heard the term intervertebral disc or herniated disc. Again, these are protective structures between the vertebral bodies of each vertebral segment. Uh, there's two portions of the intervertebral disc. There's an outer fibrous portion and an inner softer portion called the nucleus. There's a high water content in that portion. And you'll see as we go on how disc pathology can lead to various pain syndromes. So, you know, I already mentioned that the purpose of the spine is to protect the neural elements. Well, um, neural elements is kind of a vague term. You have to think about what's in there. And, you know, obviously the brain is in the skull, but as we transition uh, from up high to down low, you have the spinal cord. And then as you get to the lumbosacral spine, 
really all we're dealing with uh, is a collection of nerves called the cauda equina. Uh, and we'll look at that in more detail momentarily. Um, let's skip over that. So here is just looking down on the cervical spinal cord. Okay, so a lot of information, everything that moves your body, whether it's motor function or everything that you feel uh, in your body is traveling through this structure as it goes to the brain. And the diameter of this is quite small. It's probably about the thickness of your thumb. So very dense information in terms of um, uh, neurological importance. Down in the lumbosacral spine, you can see that the cord ends here. And these really look like strands of spaghetti and they're floating in spinal fluid. Uh, so think of strands of spaghetti floating in a water balloon or almost the fronds of a wet mop just kind of floating uh, uh, in spinal fluid. So three-dimensionally, you can see how those neural elements are traveling through these bony structures. The spine is, is it's almost like a crystal lattice or, or coral that's very porous. Uh, and the nerves have to find their way through that bony structure and out into the extremity, in this case, the leg, uh, uh, in order to relay information back and forth. Functional considerations of the spine, and I kind of already briefly uh, hit on this. You wanna think about three things. You wanna think about movement. You wanna think about the ability to feel, so sensation. And then the third thing is pain. Those are the three things that any patient that has a problem are gonna to report to you. I'm weak, I have numbness and tingling, and I have pain. So much like the electrical system of your house, the nervous system works the same way. And these signals go back and forth from your leg, through your nerves, into your spinal cord, and up into your brain. And it turns out when, when patients are telling us their story, we already begin to localize, well, where is the problem? The concept of dermatome and myotome is important, okay? Here you can see uh, how the areas on the lower extremity in the body are mapped out uh, with a grid. And each grid has a number, L2, L3, L4, and so on and so forth. And essentially, these are the areas of skin that are innervated by an individual nerve. So when we're taking a history and we're asking, where does that pain radiate to? Where, is your, where, where are you numb? Where, what's tingling? We ask that information because it helps us identify where in the nervous system, or in this case, the spine, the pathology could lie. So, you know, taking a, a typical complaint that we'll see in clinic, a 76 year old who presents with the chief complaint of low back pain that began after a fall. These are the questions that we ask um, from a patient's perspective. You may wanna think about this. We call it the OPQRST kind of um, uh, framework where we ask, what was the onset? When did this begin? What makes the symptoms better? What makes the symptoms worse? What's the quality of the pain in this case? Is it sharp? Is it stabbing? Where does it radiate to? Uh, and um, so on and so forth. Other things when you're taking a history that become important when talking about low back pain, we call them red flag symptoms. And the reason they're red flags is because it can alert the diagnostician to a very serious problem. So for example, you have a patient who has a history of cancer and they've been complaining of back pain for six weeks. You always have to be vigilant about whether or not that could represent metastatic cancer to the spine. Fairly simple. You take someone who's immunosuppressed or an IV drug user or someone who's on dialysis who has their skin punctured repeatedly. Um, you have to be thinking about infection. You do not want to miss those diagnoses. Similarly, trauma, that's an important part of the history that you want to emphasize. Now, trauma uh, oftentimes means high-speed motor vehicle collision, it fell from the roof. Uh, in the aged population, 70 and above or 60 and above, 
a simple ground level fall from standing can be significant. You can fracture your spine that way. And we see that multiple times each week. So it's a very common thing. We see that, uh, and we'll talk more about osteoporotic compression fractures shortly. A clinical presentation of urinary dysfunction, whether it be inability to empty one's bladder or overflow incontinence, loss of sensation in the part of the body that comes into contact with a saddle if you were riding a horse, progressive weakness affecting the lower extremities. All of those things are red flags that could uh, indicate a potentially uh, serious underlying problem. When you're doing a physical examination, um, you know, it, it's uh, the general appearance of a patient becomes important, motor sensory information important. I want to talk about provocative maneuvers. So you actually have to lay your hands on the, the patient and, and put them through a variety of tests. And this particular um, illustration is to point out things that we do looking for non-spine related problems, sacroiliac joint dysfunction, orthopedic problems that could, you know, uh, affecting the hip that may in fact cause referred pain to the back. So physical examination is very important. Ultimately, when you're localizing, and I love this illustration because of the uh, pictures, it's pretty poignant. You come walking into the office with a cane, yeah, you could have a lumbosacral problem. You come in in a wheelchair, oftentimes that's indicative of something much higher up in the nervous system. And we see this you know, a few times a year where patients are referred to us with low back pain or some you know, low extremity problems. And, and it actually, when you, when you examine them and you probe their history a little bit more, um, their upper extremities are affected and they often can harbor underlying cervical spine problems. So when generating a differential diagnosis, mechanical low back pain is, is what we started this discussion uh, um, with. It's the most common form of low back pain. It can result from strain to the muscles, the ligaments. It can, there can be irritation of the facet joints. Basically, this encompasses everything except anatomically identifiable causes for back pain. So basically, the most common, you know, I would say the majority of patients who have back pain, we really can't find a specific cause and we would lump them into this category. I think a better way to think about back pain rather than saying that is to put them in these three different categories, potentially serious spinal conditions. And we talked about tumor, infection, fracture, and so on and so forth. And then sciatica. Sciatica is actually a fairly generic term. Um, basically any pain or numbness that radiates from the back into the lower extremity, usually on one side, and follows the distribution of a single nerve. So it follows that grid pattern on that, on, on, you know, the dermatomal distribution on the lower extremity. That, that can be indicative of sciatica and oftentimes is indicative of a pinched nerve. And then lastly, we can lump things into the nonspecific, you know, complaint of low back pain. So symptoms that don't imply nerve impingement or don't imply a serious underlying condition. So that's the, that's the kind of the framework that I'm thinking about when patients are telling me their, their ailments. So the first thing that we're gonna talk about now is in terms of differential diagnosis will be herniated discs. Very common, happens to a lot of, of, of folks, common cause of back pain, radiculopathy or sciatica, and clinically it's, it's pain, numbness, uh, tingling, following the distribution of a single nerve. Uh, oftentimes there can be presentation of weakness. Uh, the most, one of the most obvious is, is when patients come in with something called a foot drop. Okay. They have weakness of a certain muscle group. They can't lift their foot. Um, here's an MRI where we're looking at the spine from the side. And you can see that this disc between these two vertebra, there's a bulge there. And when we look at that in a cross section, you can see is an asymmetry between this side and this side. This is a large disc herniation compressing a nerve, all right? 
So this is, again, something much different than mechanical low back pain, okay? Lumbar stenosis and neurogenic claudication, very common in the aged population. Um, and what distinguishes this from a herniated disc is that patients will often experience symptoms into both lower extremities. Symptoms are definitely activity dependent. They get worse with standing, they get worse with walking, and the symptoms are relieved with forward flexion or sitting, okay? When you look at this illustration, you can see, well, the spinal cord ends here. Here are all the nerves traveling down, right? White is spinal fluid, everything looks pretty good, except right here. And when you look at a cross section through that area, rather than looking at a very large open spinal canal, you can see there's very little room, three-dimensionally, there's little room for those nerves to travel through. So lumbar stenosis. This is a great uh, diagnosis that we see often. This is an osteoporotic compression fracture. Um, we, you can see that a normal vertebra is usually rectangular in shape. And this one is not. The analogy I give patients is it's, 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 it's as though you take a marshmallow and you squish it. And that's exactly what happens. And you can see that there's edema in that vertebra. This is something that's fresh uh, and most definitely would be the source of activity dependent back pain. And these particular patients, you know, they have a lot of trouble sleeping at night. Rolling over in bed could be excruciating. When they try to go from lying down to sitting up, um, it could be quite painful. Now the severity of pathology is getting worse, okay? This is a condition called spondylolisthesis. We briefly talked about how important it is for the segments of the spine or the vertebra to line up anatomically and protect the nerves. And you can see in here, something's just not right. This is the bottom lumbar vertebra. This is the sacrum. And it's almost as though the entire spinal column is falling off of the sacrum, okay? When that happens, you can see this is a foramen where a nerve is coming out of the spine. You can see there's some room around that nerve, not so much there. So this is something that would cause back pain, radiculopathy, radiating symptoms into the lower extremities, and again, position dependent. The clinician or diagnostician should always be thinking about additional causes of low back pain. As neurosurgeons, oftentimes we're, we're kind of shielded from this because we're not on the front lines, but one has to think about urological disorders, kidney stones, urinary tract infections, kidney infections, can all cause referred pain to the back. Um, pancreatitis, gallbladder disease can cause referred pain to the back, um, and so on and so forth. So, so again, detail, being detail-oriented, taking a good history, doing a good physical, uh, can help eliminate uh, some of those diagnoses. Everybody wants a test these days. So, you know, there, what, what can we order? X-rays, CAT scans, and MRIs. Those three things are, are really the basic imaging modalities that we look at to evaluate patients. Um, sometimes you will hear, you can't get an MRI until you get an X-ray. And... Uh, from my perspective as a neurosurgeon, that is not something that's driven by me. Oftentimes that's driven by insurance companies. Um, uh, I, I think if the clinical concern is great enough, uh, we can certainly push and, and get the appropriate testing in a timely manner. I'm gonna show you why that's important in a minute. Other tests that we use, physiological tests, EMG, nerve conduction studies. These are tests that are done by our neurology colleagues. Um, and we use them for localization. I use them really to, um, I would say I'd use them more in the neck when I'm trying to figure out if somebody has carpal tunnel or if they have a problem uh, in the cervical spine that could affect the upper extremity. Um, uh, but uh, other things that we do, are we have colleagues in interventional pain management who do procedures for the treatment of pain but we can also use their interventions as diagnostic tools. 
uh, sometimes it's not clear where the source of the pain is. Uh, and if you do an injection, for example, at a specific level or segment of the spine and a patient gets a great response, well, then we know where to focus our surgical efforts. Blood work can also be important. In this case, these are some blood tests that we would do to rule out infection. So let's take a minute and focus on this x-ray. Um, you can see that the, the pathology is where the arrow is, obviously. But look at, the, look at the relationship between this vertebra, that vertebra, and that vertebra. You can see that it's compressed, very similar to a squished marshmallow. Everything else doesn't look that bad. Then you get a CAT scan. CAT scan shows the bony anatomy in much more detail. You can see, okay, yeah, there's a, there's a fracture there. Everything else doesn't look that bad. Then you get an MRI and you could say, you know, that really does looks a little bit more than a compression fracture. You begin to see all these other spots in the vertebra. This is actually a pathologic fracture from metastatic cancer. And you can see how the MRI shows that it spread, you know, much, it spreads far beyond this particular vertebra. Uh, and, this, and, the, and the diagnosis is actually much more serious than, than an osteoporotic compression fracture. So appropriate testing is very important. Um, sometimes patients will hear, well, we can't do imaging until you fail six weeks of conservative treatment. And I think that's true for the most part, unless, and, and I emphasize the unless, because you have to really ask about these red flags right? And you're getting the sense that there's a, there's a difference between low back pain and back pain that radiates into the legs associated with symptoms of weakness, numbness, and tingling, okay? Um, I think if some, somebody has a history of previous surgery or if somebody who's had, you know, repeated flare-ups of neurogenic claudication in the past, I think it's a little unfair to, to, to make somebody wait before we do the appropriate testing. So um, that's my, my, my personal opinion. Uh, and uh, uh, oftentimes we will fight with insurance companies to get the appropriate test done. Having said that, diagnostic imaging is really only helpful in surgical candidates. So let me, let me explain what I, what I mean by that. Um, in this day and age of the electronic medical record, it is not uncommon for patients to come to the office having read their radiology reports and expect a line by line explanation of what that means. Well, this has actually been studied. So this is, this is I, don't, I don't do a lot with research and studies and papers and things like that, because I, I think that's boring for people, but this one is actually quite good. And they looked at abnormal MRI scans in asymptomatic patients. And on this particular graph, on this axis, this is percentage of patients. So 0% to 100% of patients. And we divide these patients into three groups, aged 20 to 39, 40 to 59, and 60 to 80. If you're 60 to 80, 93% of patients will have degenerated disc disease. 80% of patients will have a bulging disc. And the reason I'm emphasizing that is because some patients will come with a preconceived notion that there has to be a problem that needs to be fixed because they have a degenerated disc. And really that's not necessarily the case because you can have those radiographic findings, but not necessarily a symptom referable to it. So you might hear from us that we're treating your complaints and we're using the imaging to support your complaint and to support our intervention. So that's important. So you've been dealing with pain and now it's been a while. So you're lumped into three categories, you know, acute back pain, less than four weeks in duration. Most of these people, most patients will have complete resolution by six weeks with medical management. You have an intermediate group of four to 12 weeks. And then you have the patient with chronic back pain who's been dealing with, dealing with it for more than 12 weeks. 12 weeks. The overwhelming majority of patients with the chief complaint of back pain uh, will not progress to chronic back pain. So 
And the reason I emphasize that is because, and this is easy for me to say because I don't have pain at the moment, but when you have pain, we understand that it's, an, you know, to you, it's an emergency, it's an urgency, but if you can just ride it out and you can, and if you just go through, you know, the treatment algorithms, most people will get better. But the time scale of that is week to week, not day to day. Something that is often overlooked is what else can affect the perception of pain? So in this illustration, you will have the pain experience, no susceptive input. That just means, you know, what your brain perceives that that hurts. There's a variety of other things that can factor into a patient's overall pain experience. Uh, as a surgeon, you know, I, I typically don't go into these all that much, but I do think the consideration of them is important when talking to a patient, you know, you have to be sensitive to these things. People that are, have pain can be depressed. There can be anxiety around that pain. Um, you know, if the patient's young working, they're the only working member of their family and the pain limits them from work. Obviously that's going to create a lot of stress. Uh, some of our older population, you know, I ask them, do you feel that you're avoiding social situations because you hurt? And they say yes. So their lifestyles begin to change and get worse. That's not a good thing. Um, if you hurt, you don't exercise. If you don't exercise, you get deconditioned. And that makes the pain syndrome or pain cycle uh, just get worse. Now we're going to focus on what happens as we age? What's normal? It is absolutely normal for discs to degenerate with each decade of life. They lose their water content. Their, their ability to support and cushion the spine between the vertebra gets less and less. And you can see that here. This is a gross anatomy specimen where you have a normal disc here and an aged disc here. So that is a very normal process. Um, one can say it's not pathological because it's just a matter of fact, it happens. Additionally, you know, discs can herniate. There's a spectrum of disc herniation. Uh, as you comb through your radiology reports, you'll see this. There can be a bulge, a protrusion, an extrusion, a sequestration. Um, and again, that's just degree of herniation on a spectrum from mild to severe. We wanna emphasize bone density because that's extremely important. This should be part of your health maintenance discussions with your primary care physicians as you get older. Uh, it's normal for bone density to decrease. Uh, the porosity of the bone increases, and consequently, as a result of that, your risk for a spinal fracture goes up. Um, uh, you can see that this would be normal bone density. This is a patient with osteoporosis, uh, so the scaffolding um, of the skeleton or particularly of the spine uh, uh, for the purpose of today's talk is reduced. The ability of those bones to support the spine and protect the nerves is reduced uh, and the uh, incidence of fracture unfortunately goes up. Additionally, as we age, the bone morphology can change. You develop this, the, the quote unquote bone spur. How many times have you heard, you know, your physician say, oh, you just have a bone spur. I, I like to give people the analogy of an arthritic hand because we've all seen folks with arthritis of their hands, their knuckles enlarge, uh, their fingers can deviate because the, the, the quality or the shape of the bone is changing. We spend a lot of time talking about the three-dimensional nature of the spine. And if the bone, if you're developing bone spurs, you know, that they're, they're taking up more space. And as a result of that, there's less space for the nerves and that's going to lead to compression. And that obviously leads to clinical symptoms. And that's what we're seeing here. This is a great schematic where you can see degenerated disc disease, arthritis of the facet joints uh, and nerve impingement and the clinical manifestation of that. This is what we're trying to avoid. So ultimately, this is a great video that shows how the nerves can be pinched from disc degeneration. The vertebra get close together. That window uh, is reduced. 
nerves get pinched, the stability or alignment of the spine becomes compromised, uh, and clinical uh, syndromes result. We will hear often what happened. Why, why is it that my symptoms are made worse with standing? Why, why does it get better if I sit or if I lean forward? And it can all be brought back to basic anatomy. When you stand, the diameter of your spinal canal gets smaller. The nerves get compressed. It's as simple as that. If you sit or you lean forward, you're opening up those areas. The ligaments kind of tighten up. And as a result, the diameter increases. You're offloading the pressure on those nerve roots as they come out of the spine and the symptoms get better. So you can see, you know, you probably have a lot of friends. You talk about your symptoms. There's a lot of symptom overlap, but it all comes back to the anatomy of the problem. And it's quite logical. So when we treat you with a complaint of back pain, what are, what are the treatment goals? We want to reverse any neurological deficit. We want to relieve pain. We want to correct instability. We want to restore mobility. But most importantly, we want to improve your functional capacity. We want to improve your quality of life. We cannot guarantee that we'll make you normal like you were in your 20s. But I think with appropriate diagnosis and prudent treatment, we're pretty good at making people uh, enjoy better, better lifestyles. And we've been hinting at this, that there's a continuum of care. Um, uh, everything begins, if appropriate, with medical care. Medical care includes lifestyle modification, physical therapy, drug management with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, interventional pain management, um, surgical care we'll talk about in a moment. And I think it's important to share our philosophy that most patients in the absence of a red flag, in the absence of a major neurological deficit, uh, we will try conservative treatment prior to considering operative intervention. This has been studied um, by the North American Spine Society. And I, I put this in here just to give you a sense of um, how exhausting the study of back pain can be. This was published in 2020, and it's a 217-page document about how to diagnose and treat back pain. And you know, this is supposed to be evidence-based. I think all patients want their doctors to um, treat based on uh, scientific evidence. It actually turns out that a lot of the recommendations fall under category I of insufficient evidence to actually make a recommendation. Not everything, but a lot. So starting with medical treatment, you, patients will say, well, I, I, I think I should just be on bed rest. Bed rest might be okay, excuse me, bed rest might be okay if it's short duration. You know, it's an option for patients. Oftentimes if they have leg symptoms, those ridiculous symptoms going down the leg to the foot, uh, but anything beyond four days is actually a detriment. Um, so, so it's not, prolonged bed rest is certainly not in the uh, modern framework of treating low back pain. Activity modification makes a lot of sense, um, but that doesn't mean become immobile. You want to achieve an acceptable level of discomfort while continuing physical activity in order to minimize the disruption of your daily activities, right? Daily activities are our goal. We want to be able to execute those. That's our goal. And we want to do so with an acceptable level of discomfort. That means different things to different people. It depends, obviously, on what your responsibilities are. Um, you know, someone who does a lot of heavy lifting or someone who uh, has a job with prolonged sitting or bending, twisting, so on and so forth, it may be very difficult to carry out those activities of daily living. Um, and it's not unreasonable to conclude that work-related activities can certainly contribute to low back problems. Physical therapy and exercise, you know, this is very common sense stuff. Um, it turns out that a general fitness program that's actually not focused on anything, just some, just exercise, uh, the goal of which is to improve your overall fitness, mm -hmm. that will have a tremendous impact on reducing low back pain and actually preventing low back pain. Patients will say, what can I do to make sure this doesn't happen again? Or what can, what can I do to avoid this in the future? It's exercise. 
You know, I mean, we, we pay our doctors to tell us to eat right, exercise, not smoke, don't drink. It's all common sense kind of stuff. So, you know, easier said than done for some people, but a general fitness program will certainly um, help you prevent problems long-term. Lumbar stabilization exercises. Now we're escalating uh, um, the intervention uh, a little bit more focused. We're focusing on the back muscles. And we do know, and this has been proven, that if you have a PT or a physical therapist supervised program, outcomes in terms of pain reduction will be better. And I try to tell patients, you know, they say, oh, you know, I know what to do. Uh, yeah, you know, I looked on the internet, I've done some exercises. That's great, but the science doesn't support that. This is, a, this is one where science actually supports doing exercise supervised by a physical therapist. In terms of medical therapy, um, NSAIDs, Tylenol or a plus. Opioids for severe pain, usually radicular, meaning usually leg pain, not low back pain for a very short duration of action, uh, duration. Uh, chronic opioid therapy is not a treatment. I think that's a fairly universal message uh, in this day and age. Muscle relaxants, they scientifically have not been shown to be more effective than non-steroidals. Oftentimes, oral steroids will be used, whether it be uh, methylprednisolone or prednisone. Gabapentin is a drug that's used commonly. And then lastly, antidepressants. I'm not going to get into medical management much further than that. I want to get into the surgical treatment. So let's imagine you've tried all medical treatments. You have not had sufficient relief. Now we're discussing surgical options. All surgery follows two basic principles. The first is decompression. If I have compressed nerves, I have to relieve that compression. I have to change the anatomy. So to do that, you remove bone, you remove ligament, you remove disc material, anything that's putting pressure on a nerve. The second component of surgery is to stabilize. Sometimes the degenerative process in and of itself can lead to instability. Sometimes our surgical treatment to decompress can lead to instability. When we say stabilize, we mean fuse. And sometimes you need screws and rods in your spine in order to stabilize. The title of this talk is Minimally Invasive Spine Surgery or Minimally Invasive Techniques. You know, that minimally invasive are certainly two words that permeate through all of medicine and all of surgery. There are billboards on the highways about minimally invasive this, that, and the other. You know, I think the, the fundamental principle of minimally invasive spine surgery is we're gonna use smaller incisions than traditional surgery. Therefore, we're gonna reduce trauma to nearby muscle and structures. But we want to be able to access the anatomy and accomplish the goal of decompression. And hopefully we can do that without creating instability. So these two illustrations show you laminectomy, a removal of bone and ligament through a minimally invasive approach as opposed to an open approach, okay? The open approach, we're splitting the muscle, we're exposing the spine in order to decompress. The advantages of the minimally invasive approach is that it comes from one side right? Not both sides. You're preserving ligaments, which are meant to protect and stabilize the spine. You're preserving the facet joint on the opposite side of your approach. So there's less disruption of normal anatomy. Theoretically, there should be a decrease in blood loss with minimally invasive approaches. You should have a shorter hospital length of stay. In fact, most minimally invasive approaches can be done in an outpatient manner. The risk of infection is certainly reduced, and um, uh, there's a reduction in postoperative pain. Now, this sounds great, but one thing one has to consider is area of exposure. How much can I expose? How many segments through this approach as opposed to this approach? So the technique doesn't apply to every single pathology. So this, 
So minimally invasive approaches for common problems or diagnoses that we talked about. For a compression fracture, the minimally invasive treatment would be kyphoplasty. For herniated discs, the minimally invasive approach is a microdiscectomy. For lumbar stenosis, we will do a laminectomy. And then for multifactorial problems, we may elect to do fusion surgery. I'm going to talk about kyphoplasty. <clears throat> kyphoplasty is a great treatment for osteoporotic compression fractures. Um, like I said, it's minimally invasive. This, the procedure itself takes 30 minutes or less, uh, and it's done under conscious sedation. Patients are not under general anesthesia. Uh, I, I actually consider this a procedure. I don't necessarily consider it an operation per se. Um, uh, and you know the, the, the benefits for, for patients can be quite dramatic. There are three steps to doing the procedure. We use x-rays to guide placement of a working channel into the bone. We inflate a balloon to create a cavity, and we fill that up with bone cement. The way you want to think about this is it's, it's almost as though it's an internal cast. You know, that's, this cement that we inject in there will harden in about 60 seconds, 60 to 90 seconds, and it immediately stabilizes this broken bone. Imagine breaking your, your arm and shaking it. That's going to hurt quite a bit. Well, the spine, you don't have great ways to immobilize it short of fusion. You know, you can put somebody in a brace, but that really doesn't immobilize the spine. Fusion surgery in an osteo, for an osteoporotic compression fracture, sometimes we do it, but obviously that's a much more invasive technique than a 30-minute procedure uh, that can accomplish uh, restoration of stability to that fractured segment. So here you can see this particular patient is lying on their stomach. We've accessed this broken vertebra. And here we're going to inject the cement into that vertebra. We do it under x-ray guidance. We want to control the spread of that cement so it doesn't leak out towards the nerves. The nerves will be all up in here. So you can see we're keeping it far away from where the nerves travel. This is a tactile procedure. You might ask, well, how do you know when to stop putting the cement in? You can do that both visually, but also as you inject that cement, you can feel the pressure that's required in order to deliver it through that working channel. And that gives you some information on when to stop. Here's the final result. You see a good fill through this broken vertebra. And then what you're left with is just a little puncture site in your skin on both sides. Sometimes there's two puncture sites. Sometimes we can actually accomplish this from just one side approach. Minimally invasive discectomy, laminotomy, and laminectomy. So this is a huge part of what we do on a weekly basis, okay? And again, it's to treat herniated discs, spinal stenosis, uh, pinched nerves. Procedurally, this is done under general anesthesia with a patient lying on their stomach. So we approach this from their back, okay? You wanna access the spine. We make a, a window by drilling away some of the bone. Okay, we take down some of the abnormal facet joint, remove some ligament, expose the neural elements, and if need be, remove disc material. So here you can see is the first cannula that comes in. This is the sacrum, this is L5. We're sequentially putting larger cannulas through the muscle. We're dilating the muscle so that ultimately we put in a working channel that we attach to the operating table. The diameter of that working channel is only 18 millimeters. So we can do quite a bit through 18. 18 millimeters is probably about the width of your thumbnail. So it's, it's not very big. So even through a small cylindrical port like that, we can maintain enough surgical maneuverability in order to do what we need to do in terms of neural decompression. And this is just a, a video actually showing you. This is Dr. Hool's video. Um, he's right-handed. He's holding a drill in his right hand, a sucker in his left hand, and he's removing bone. And when you're removing bone, 
it's great to have ligament there because the ligament is actually protecting you from the drill. So this, you can see he's moving the ligament out of the way with a curette. He's elevating that ligament off of the nerve underneath. And the, the, the basic principle is, okay, if there's not enough room for the nerves, how do I make more room? It's as simple as that, it's decompression. And then you're done. These are the, the, the <clears throat> those are the nerves that were pulsating, indicating that the area was quite relaxed. A herniated disc would be under that nerve, so you'd have to move the nerve to the side. When you're done, you take out your cylindrical port, you put in a stitch, you close that incision, you put some glue on the surface, you can go home that night, take a shower the next morning, no problem. Minimally invasive fusion surgery, um, I'm gonna focus on one, it's called interspinous process fusion device placement. Uh, there's a variety of minimally invasive fusions. This is one technique that we employ fairly routinely. Again, we do this for the treatment of lumbar stenosis. We're looking down on a spine. And here you can see bone and ligament have been removed to decompress the nerves. You can do this on both sides. And then when you're done with that, you put in a little device, a metal clamp between those spinous processes that ultimately will serve as a surface area for bone to grow. And that has comparable strength to pedicle screws. Um, it, it, it certainly is a safer procedure than in a traditional posterior lumbar interbody fusion that can be more destructive. Um, but I think if the indications are right, this is a great technique uh, to treat uh, lumbar stenosis. So I'm gonna conclude with kind of some summary points. Uh, low back pain is common. There's a variety of causes. They're not always spinal or neurological. Um, symptoms that affect the legs imply nerve compression. Uh, and that's much different than just low back pain. Be aware of the red flags in one's history. Correlation between your symptoms and imaging is a predictor of a good surgical outcome. Always start with medical treatment with an, when appropriate. And minimally invasive are two words that apply to the technique. The fundamental principles of the surgery remain the same as traditional open techniques. I wanna thank you for your attention and your time. Um, if you have any questions about today, or the, today's talk, please, you can email um, this access line at cape.health.org. If you have any suggestions about topics you'd like to hear more about from a neurosurgery, uh, we'd love to hear from you because you know, when they say, hey, you guys want to give a talk, it's very helpful to know what people want to hear about. Uh, and then lastly, this, this presentation will be recorded and available on this website um, in about a week or so. So uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I know Dr. Papavasilio has a few, few slides that he wants to um, uh, review. I was going to go through some questions first. Want to go through some questions? Yes, yeah, we have a few questions from the audience. So, um, I thought we'd start with those. Um, the first question I think is a very good question. It's a gentleman who's who's had back pain and done all the medical treatments that Dr. Cope has described, physical therapy, acupuncture, cortisone injections, and now is considering surgery. Um, and he's had three, <laughs> three opinions um, by three different surgeons, and they've all given him different recommendations. And his question is, what factors should I consider to help me decide what procedure to have done and whether now is the time to do it? You want to take that? Sure. That's a tough one. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think a big part is has to do with the relationship with the physician for me and, and vice versa as well. So I think the better understanding I have with my patient, what they expect of me and what I expect of them in terms of taking care of the surgery, should they have it? What do they want to get out of it? Do they find the risk acceptable? That relationship is probably the most important because I think my biggest failures are when my the expectations aren't on the same plane. 
So if the patient's wanting one thing and I'm not delivering that, that's where disappointment comes in. So I think for me, management of expectations, having a good rapport with the patient is the biggest part. So if you find someone you can work with, you like how they present it to you, you like what they have to say, I think gut feeling has a, a big part to do with it, believe it or not. And it just shows you how many different style points are if you're being presented with three different surgeries for presumably the same condition and we're all seeing the same stuff, um, then you gotta like what you hear for the right reasons. I don't know if that was Yeah, it. I think that's very true. I think, you know, there's lots of different ways to, to address, as Dr. Copa said, decompress and stabilize the spine and, and certain physicians are certain, trained in certain ways to do bigger procedures sometimes. Sometimes physicians are trained to do less invasive procedures and it depends on what they're comfortable with. Um, you can often get the same results with two different procedures. Um, but I think if you're presented with three different options by the same surgeon and they go over all those options with you and what they think the outcomes will be and what to expect from each outcome and you make that choice with them, I think that's probably the, the best way to go about deciding whether to go ahead with surgery. I think one thing in terms of when do I have it, you know, what you're really talking about are indications for surgery. And, and, I, and I think absolute indications really should be if you have neurological deficit or not. You know, if you have fairly consistent, measurable weakness mm -hmm. and constant sensory change in your leg, your doctor should probably say it's time. If you're dealing with just a pain syndrome in the absence of neurological deficit, as surgeons, we usually wait for the patients to tell us they're ready. Correct. You know, it's, 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 and how do you know when you're ready? Well, we don't live with the pain, you do. So you have to look at how it affects your daily quality of life. You know, when you start not going to cocktail parties or not, you're missing events out of fear of, I don't think I can make it that far. I don't think I could sit there for that long. If that's the way you want to live, then fine. But if you want to do better and three surgeons tell you surgery is reasonable, it may be time to do, do an operation. What operation? That's, yeah, there's a lot, that's a lot a to go into deciding what surgery to do yeah. you know, based on your, your medical condition, your, you know, what your expectations are. And um, I think it's a, that's, best thing would be to go over all the different options and, and then decide which one's best for you. And sometimes the philosophy of, you know, just because you have one procedure, well, and this, I mean, we don't know the three that they're presenting, but, you know, you can do another one. You know, you can start with a lesser approach. And if the result is not satisfactory, you can reoperate and do another one most of the time. You know, there are bailout strategies. Hmm. Yeah, I have a lot of patients that say, well, if you're in there, just fix everything you see that's wrong. But sometimes the one and done approach isn't necessarily what you want. You know, going for to fix the entire MRI uh, can be dangerous or very, very risky. So sometimes in an effort to give you the maximal benefit, we'll try something smaller first. It's not because we want to keep reoperating, but we think, well, I'm hearing from this man or woman, it's my leg, my leg, my leg. We can unpinch one nerve and help potentially help the leg. But then we'll turn around and say, can you live with the rest of the back pain? If I got rid of the leg, can you live with that? So sometimes there's compromises when you're talking about the risk and benefit for big versus little surgery. All right, another question we have here is, um, someone has a diagnosis of piriformis syndrome and they also have spinal stenosis with sciatica. Um, can both be treated during the same stenosis surgery? I can answer that. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a good one because someone's been doing some research if they're already that sophisticated, they're thinking about piriformis. So it's a completely different problem, not related to the back. It's a, a pinched nerve basically in your butt. It's where the nerve exits between mus muscle fibers. So a relatively easy way to find out is if they inject it in that area with a steroid local anesthetic and it gets rid of the pain, that would suggest that the piriformis, the butt muscle is the problem and not the back and you may have just avoided back surgery. So sometimes we're sending you for shots and you know, you'll get the reply, well, I don't wanna be a pin cushion doc. Well, it's because we're trying to rule stuff out and help you avoid the big one. So it's important. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And uh, 
the other, the flip side of that is um, if you do have sciatica um, and you have the piriformis injection, uh, sometimes sciatica can present with buttock pain and you don't mm. really actually have piriformis. You have stenosis affecting the L5 nerve root and it's giving you buttock pain and sciatica. And if the piriformis shot doesn't help, there's a good chance that the surgery will probably help both of those things. Right. Can you say more about spinal instability and what defines an unstable segment? So, I mean, most of the images that we presented, like a CAT scan, uh, an MRI, those are all static images with you lying down on your back. So if you see any abnormal alignment of the vertebral segments, we say it's unstable because the alignment is not normal. There's been a slip, for the lack of a better word. But they're not dynamic studies. They really have no, they convey no information with you moving around. Sometimes we'll get x-rays with you standing up and then we'll have you go through an, a range of motion, flex forward, lean backwards. And you can actually radiographically measure different vertebral segments moving. So in that instance, you have gross overt dynamic instability. But if you, if you just have an MRI and you see an abnormal alignment or a spondylolisthesis, we call that degenerative instability. You also have to remember if you're gonna treat those problems surgically, you're removing bone and ligament. So you're, you're, you're creating or fostering more instability by your treatment, therefore, you have to consider a stabilizing uh, adjunct to any decompressive procedure. Right, so I think as in addition to that, sometimes we create instability in the process of fixing the problem, right? We can see a little bit of shifting of the vertebrae, but we know to get that nerve out of that nerve, we've got to take a lot of bone and ligament away and therefore make it worse. So if we take your part, we have to put you back together again. And And, as Nick had said, when we're talking about instability, we're typically talking about spinal fusion in most patients um, and there's various types of spinal fusions. Um, but there's been good studies on patients who have degenerative spondylolisthesis and stenosis that shows you know, the treatment option, the best surgical treatment option uh, for those patients is uh, a spinal fusion because you can address the instability, the stenosis and the facet arthritis that's present as the underlying cause of all, all the problems at that segment. So, um, you know, that's a discussion to have uh, with your, your surgeon, but, you know, there's everyone's concerned about having a spinal fusion, um, rightly so, but uh, in general, if you have a degenerative spondylolisthesis with, with instability, it's been well documented that a spinal fusion is a very good surgical option for that patient. These are great questions, by the way. So I like it when my patients come in and ask me this type of stuff. So they've been thinking about it, they're involved, they're engaged. The more invested the patient is, the better the outcome, almost regardless, because they're half the process, right? So you're not just a surgeon, it's not McDonald's, you're not, people aren't driving through getting their fix, it's two-way street of communication. All right, this is a patient who's had a laminectomy uh, for back pain and did not get much relief, um, and then underwent a radiofrequency ablation which also unfortunately did not give them much relief. Uh, and then had a steroid injection recently on one side, which did give relief. And the question is, should I do a steroid injection on the left side? That's hard for us to answer because we don't know the precise problem or the anatomy of the problem. Um, but I think, you know, and, and I'm not one of the pain specialists, we would certainly defer to our pain management colleagues, but generally the risk benefit analysis of a steroid injection leans far in favor of benefit, meaning they're very safe. You're not gonna have a major adverse event for the most part with a steroid injection. And it certainly doesn't hurt to try. So, so you can't look at a situation and predict, okay, this patient's going to do excellently with a, with a steroid injection. And unfortunately, it's somewhat of a, you have to go through it and you see what happens. Um, so I, I don't think there's any harm in, in trying. 
But it also speaks to something you talked about, Nick, when you talked about back pain. So when we do surgery for back pain in isolation without shooting sciatic pain, leg pain, we're talking about just good old back pain, our success rate isn't that high, regardless of what we do. That's why we're trying to exhaust everything. Because as, as Dr. Copa mentioned, it's multifactorial, the bone, the ligament, the disc, the facet joints. So it's rare that we're trying to pitch a cure from back pain. So the scenario that was mentioned there almost reminds me of someone who had surgery for back pain expecting to have the back pain fixed. Which So maybe that was a problem in a couple of ways where the, the expectations weren't managed or they weren't communicating well. But probably if you ask us, is this gonna fix my back pain? I think all three of us would have moderated that a bit and said, this is not a cure for back pain, it might get a bit better. So it sounds like there's disappointment and we're going backwards in terms of trying to add other injections, which may or may not help. But, but Dr. Cope is correct. It's, uh, shots are very low risk and you don't have much to lose by trying it. I know, I know we don't have a mechanism to go back and forth, but to whomever asked that question, did you have leg symptoms or claudication or some sort of radiculopathy prior to your operation? Yeah, that, that's uh, not clear in the question. Yeah. Um, but I think you're doing the right things after you know, the, the laminectomy not getting relief. I think the ablation is a very good procedure to try. Mm -hmm. Radiofrequency ablation is a procedure done in the pain clinic to um, address back pain. Um, it's something that can be done you know, prior to surgery uh, as well. It's a procedure done in the pain clinic where they numb up the nerve to the, to the joint of the spine. And if that numbing medicine gives you some relief for a short period of time, then they can put a radiofrequency probe down to that level and ablate the nerve to the joint which sometimes really helped the back pain. Um, so I think that was a good thing to try. Um, which is, you know, those kind of concepts are interesting. You're basically stopping the pain signal from going to, from the origin, from going to your brain. Right. You're, you're, you're just altering normal neurophysiology by eliminating the ability to perceive that pain. Yeah, some patients have the misconception that, it, well, if I dull the pain with the shot, well, I then accidentally injure myself by pushing it too far. And I don't think I've actually seen that. I think that they have the pain, but it's reduced. And after the shot works and it's reduced, everyone's nervous to get back to where they were, so they protect it. So it's rare that you're out doing stupid stuff after you've had an injection because you feel like you're cured. Uh, we have another question um, with regards to SI joint fusion procedures. Oh, sophisticated questions, right? Do you want to take that one? Or? I actually don't do a lot of SI yeah. joint fusions. Yes, yeah, so that's kind of a newer technique that we've been doing. It's it's to help people with what's called sacroiliitis. It's a condition where the, the joint where your pelvis meets your sacral bone, sort of at the top of the butt really, is painful. It's usually tender to the touch. And so we usually try injections and physical therapy to help with that. If that fails, there's a, a way to make a small incision and do image guided surgery to fuse that joint. It usually takes 30 to 45 minutes and you go home that day, assuming you have the right diagnosis. So that's that's where the exam's important. I think diagnosing true sacroiliac dysfunction is probably more difficult than the procedure itself. Could be, yeah. And probably takes longer, takes <laughs> longer to figure out that that's the cause. Right than it does to yeah. do the procedure and recover from it. But sometimes back to the pin cushion issue is that we will send you for an injection into the SI joint to numb it up. And if that helps, then we know that was the smoking gun, right? So we're trying to eliminate other possible causes. So if you have an injection, it only worked for a week and now you're back to where you were, well, at least we have a data point saying that was the issue. Therefore, if we have to fuse it, our success rate's higher. And we have a lot of good questions here. Um, this patient had a spinal fusion seven years ago and is now having more pain, um, back spasms, um, and was wondering if there's anything that can be done with a minimally invasive procedure. Can you try that one? Sure. Um, so anything that we do surgically tends or can have um, consequences down the line. So a spinal fusion, um, the issue with the spinal fusion is it puts more stress on the segment above your fusion. And over time, that segment can degenerate and lead to spinal stenosis um, or instability. Um, so if, if you've had a previous spinal fusion, the, the next, and you're, and you're developing pain years later, it would be good to get an MRI scan to see what is actually happening at the level above or below the fusion. 
Um, and in certain instances where there is no instability um, and not significant arthritis um, at the level above the fusion, you can do a minimally invasive laminectomy and not extend the fusion. Um, if the MRI shows that there is a lot of stenosis and severe nerve root compression where the nerve is exiting, in other words, if the foramen that Dr. Copa was talking about is really compressed, um, those patients typically would need an extension of their fusion to address that. Um, and a minimally invasive technique would probably not be in, in your best interest if, if that were to be the case. Right, but we're also trying to synthesize a lot of stuff. So when we meet you and you're sizing us up and we're sizing you up, I mean, if you're 400 pounds and diabetic and heavy smoker and a lot of risk factors, then fusion may not be the way to go. And so we're trying to help, you know, the most bang for the buck with the least risk. Is it a young person who's going to go back to construction work? Is it an 80 year old woman just trying to play pickleball? So a lot of things we're actually factoring in in the background as well. All right, this is a, a good question we actually hear a lot about is, um, I have spinal stenosis and I've been managing for 10 years with steroid injections at the pain clinic four times a year. Is this going to cause a problem? It hasn't yet. <laughs> um, so historically, you know, surgeons don't like complications that are iatrogenic, mean, meaning, they don't like to cause problems for the patient. I mean, that's pretty intuitive. We all want good outcomes. Patients want good outcomes. We want good outcomes for our patients. Sometimes things happen in the OR, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's controlled trauma, but it's, it's surgery in itself is an unnatural thing to do on the human body. And one of the, it's not really a complication, it's more of an intraoperative occurrence. I, we touched upon how the nerves are contained in a sac that can, in, in spinal fluid kind of circulates around the nerves. It's almost like operating around a water balloon, trying not to puncture the water balloon. And sometimes you do. And then sometimes the nerves come out and you have to repair that. And it's not always, it's not a difficult thing to do. It's, it's an occurrence. And we were all historically taught that repeated injections may cause scar tissue in the area of interest so that if you were subsequently to operate in that area, it may increase the risk of a dural opening or a spinal fluid leak. I, you know, I, I would never tell somebody, stop doing the injections out of fear of what could happen. Mm -hmm. just, just enjoy the fact that they work for you. I don't know if you guys would say anything. True, it's a little frustrating for me. Sometimes I, I hear heard stories of people having over a dozen injections. I mean, it's still invasive, it's still money, it's still time out when you've been hurting a long time. But if there's a specific structural basis for it mm -hmm. that I could have fixed a decade ago, that's kind of a bummer too, right? So sometimes, you know, people don't have to go through that. We should be able to help you stratify those choices, thing for the buck. Yeah, and, and, you know, as, as we talked about earlier with um, osteoporosis, if, if you're doing several injections each year, mm. it's like being on chronic steroids, uh, and that can weaken your yeah, bones. So, definitely. you know, 10 years, four shots a year is, you know, it's, it's great that you got relief with, with that, but, you know, there are consequences to be on steroids for that many years, and, mm. you know, you should probably have a bone density done just to make sure you're not developing any osteoporosis. That's a good point. That is a good point. Um, we've had a couple questions about PRP injections in the spine. So proton, protein rich plasma? Yes. yes. We just discussed that earlier. Mm. I don't know the scientific data behind it, but I'm fairly certain there's no evidence that supports it. But, 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 I haven't done a research of the literature to, to say that definitively. Yeah, according to my orthopedic, our orthopedic colleagues, it has good data in knees, maybe hips and possibly the elbows, but not in the spine. It just hasn't been borne out in the literature that any of us are aware of. And it's not covered by insurance. And it's a lot of money. And it, there is, as far as I know, there is no guideline that shows 
level one evidence that class A evidence that that's a benefit to people. No, I had a very distinct memory no also. Guidelines. Yeah, a woman from Florida who had an injection was twelve thousand dollars and came up with a big ruptured disc on her MRI that we then shaved down and it made it better. So we can help you with some of these studies and what's what's real, what's not. Uh, so question about what is the recuperation time after different procedures? I think that's variable. I mean, it's, it's, I know people want to have something definitive so they can plan their life. And I'll tell you, I think we kind of conform to a general statement of, you know, about six weeks for this and three months for that. But we've all seen plenty of patients that, you know, do really, really, really well, very quickly. And we all have patients that, you know, God, I, I would have expected you to be doing better by now. And I think something that also plays a role in recuperation is the patient. I put one picture up there saying that the pain experience is affected by many other non-anatomic reasons, you know, and a lot of that can be psychological, behavioral, is there a secondary gain or motivation underlying it? Is, it? is the pain syndrome from a motor vehicle collision? Is it a work-related or workers' compensation issue? Some of those things can preclude people from ever getting better. You know, I wouldn't say that's common. So that's a difficult, everybody's unique and you can't really come up with definitive uh, two weeks, you'd be good. Yeah, I think we want you to walk after almost any procedure we do, whether it's brain surgery, minimally invasive, or fusion. Walking is good. Using pain is your guideline. I think we tell everyone that. I think fairly universal for me anyway is six weeks or so before therapy has started and is getting you back into the gym, the Pilates, the tennis, pickleball, what have you. It's a rough guideline for me. No, yeah, that'd be a good one to have a physical therapist on the panel, yeah. you know, because I actually said to the patient the other day, making rounds, you know, I'm making rounds and he, he wanted to talk and talk about all this stuff. And I said, I said you know, I said, listen to the nurse, the nurse is going to take great care of you. They, they, they know better than, than I, in yeah. terms of getting you through the next week or two, you know, I'm kind of like, and so maybe we'll have to think about that, getting a, some physical therapist who actually recovers these patients long-term and, and, and uh, monitors how they do. That's so, a uh, good question about cervical spine disease and can any of these minimally invasive procedures be used in patients with cervical spine issues? I use one, I use one. So I'll use, if you want, if, if I'm trying to decompress a single nerve, it's almost, it's almost like sciatica of the arm. If you have neck pain that goes down the arm um, and there's a pinched nerve in the neck, I will use that cylindrical port to, to access the spine from the back in order to drill away a little bone. Mm. It's called a foraminotomy. Um, but that's, that's, I mean, there's the other surgeons out there, I think that probably broaden their utilization of minimally invasive techniques to the cervical spine. But for me, it's just that one procedure. And that would be the same for me as well. I mean, most of the stuff that we do in the cervical spine um, involve decompressing the spinal cord and we want to get a good view of what we're decompressing to make sure the spinal cord is adequately decompressed. Right, so it's not done a lot. It's not the, the preferential way to, to treat the sciatica of the arm, as, as Dr. Copa put it. A lot of times if someone has neck pain or we need to decompress the spinal cord, like Dr. Papa Basilio said, it's going, going to be a different approach, but we do use it sometimes. The, the non-invasive stuff can still be used. The, the physical mm. therapy, the cortisone injections, the radiofrequency ablation, those are all procedures that still can be, can be done. These are high-level questions. It's good. We have a few questions about um, the intercept procedure, which is a newer procedure. Um, I guess I should, I have a couple of slides I can try and share with, and then 
Um, we can talk a little bit about the procedure. I can figure out how to share my screen. Let's see. So we talked a little bit about uh, radio frequency ablation uh, for treating um, facet arthropathy, where we ablate the, the nerve to the joint of the spine. Um, and we've also actually talked about kyphoplasty. Uh, kyphoplasty is a procedure where we put cement into the compression fracture to stabilize it. Um, and the, the intraset procedure is a kind of a combination of those two procedures. It's a procedure that's been designed to ablate the basal vertebral nerve um, in the spine, just below the disc base, that could be the cause of some person's lower back pain. Um, it's a newer procedure. Um, it was actually just highlighted on Good Morning America recently, so people have been talking about it a lot. Um, it's it's minimally invasive. It has a very brief recovery. It's done with a you know just a small incision, just like a kyphoplasty, where we're just putting a needle into the bone. Um, it preserves the overall structure of the spine. It can be a long-term relief uh, of back pain in some patients, and it's 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 safe. Um, it's it's something that can be done in patients who have um, modic changes on their MRI scan. Modic changes are visualized on the MRI scan on this, this bottom right, where you see changes above and below the disc base. Um, and these chronic end plate changes we think can lead to pain in some patients. Um, it's called discogenic back pain. In the past, if someone had a very discogenic L4-5 or L5-S1 disc um, with end plate changes and severe back pain, those patients would undergo a spinal fusion, um, but the intercept procedure is designed to try and avoid the fusion in, in these patients. Um, and it's, as I said, it's basically a combination of a kyphoplasty and an ablation. So. We use x-rays to place a needle into the bone. And then there's a catheter that's kind of extended through to the area where the basal vertebral nerve is. Um, and then you turn up the heat and basically ablate the nerve to the end plates to try and help with the back pain. Um, it's a newer procedure. I have not actually done one. Dr. Hull has done a couple of them. And it's, it's something that we all could do in the right patient because it's just a combination of, of uh, the kyphoplasty and the ablation that we do um, in the OR already. So um, it's something that, you know, has some benefits. And if you're, you know, seen in the office and you have an MRI scan that shows degenerative end plate changes without a lot of nerve root compression, and your main issue is lower back pain, I think, you know, you, you potentially could be a candidate for this procedure. Um, time will tell how effective it is as more and more patients have it. We'll be able to tell um, more so whether it has long lasting relief um, or is, is appropriate for different populations of patients. So again, you know, when, you, when, you, when you're the one in pain and you're going through that risk benefit analysis <laughs> in your own mind, mm -hmm. certainly would seem that something like this falls in favor of benefit, you know, low risk. Yeah, I think if you can avoid a spinal fusion and yeah. do this procedure without much, much risk, and if it fails, still do the spinal fusion, I don't think there's a big downside to trying it in, in the right patient without a lot of nerve root compression. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would think that the risk of the procedure is accessing the vertebra, which we have so much experience doing from our kyphoplasty population, that access would not be a problem, you know, getting that where we need to get it, so... We'll have to see with more numbers. Yeah. Low risk is one part of the equation. Yeah. yeah. Right. Efficacy is another. Right. Are you still sharing? Could be. Quite a few comments saying that Dr. Copa did an excellent presentation. So that was nice. Dr. Copa. Very good.
this patient has a question about reflexes. I have no reflexes in my leg. Mm. Is this from my lower back pain? That can be a normal variant. So some people are just tuned differently than other people. Some people very high strung. It can also be related to the medications you're on. So either one, you can be born that way. Number two, it could be related to medications. Number three, it can be rarely related to pinched nerves in the spine. Um, I wouldn't hang my hat on just that one symptom. I mean, if you're sitting there tapping on your knees at night, maybe you should see a doctor. You know? no, no, no. no, I know. And I mean, in a good way, if you're having back pain and it's shooting down your legs, then it, it's a good thing to correlate. I agree with Dr. Nakata. I, I think we talked about physical exam and how we use it to diagnose and localize. Right. I don't use reflexes to make decisions about treatment for the low back. I use reflexes to diagnose spinal cord compression and find, you know, concerns somewhere else, you know, higher up. Right. Right. If there, right. if you have exaggerated you know, pathological hyperactive reflexes, mm -hmm. that's a problem. Blunted reflexes or absent reflexes, you know, not gonna, not gonna operate for that. Okay, I have another question about uh, someone who's had chronic back pain for 15 years and the suggestion was uh, they should have a spinal cord stimulator. And what are the thoughts on spinal cord stimulation? Probably should be best addressed with, to our pain management colleagues. We're not the, we don't do them. We don't put them in. I don't know. I've revised them. It's not always easy. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I've had a few patients with spinal cord stimulators, um, and some of them do really well. The 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 pain doctors these days do do a trial with the spinal cord stimulator prior to implanting it, so it gives you some idea whether or not you're going to get some relief. Um, if you've seen a, a surgeon um, and there really isn't any other surgical procedure that they can do and you've exhausted all the non-operative options, trying the spinal cord stimulator trial is not a big procedure and it's probably worth entertaining. Um, Would you say that spinal cord stimulation, how you've done your medical you know, treatment, failed that, is spinal cord stimulation the next tier of treatment procedurally if you have never had any operative intervention? I don't see it that way. Is it no. a first line treatment surgically? I would say it's more of a last line treatment. Like last more line. of a last line treatment. Also, once you have one of those implanted, it's a, it's a metal wire, so you can't have an MRI because a wire in a magnet induces a current. You can't have that on the spinal cord, so no more MRIs. Although some of the newer ones are MRI compatible. Yeah. So so, um, not sure if we have any time for any more questions. One more question. Um, what can I do um, on my own to try and decrease my back pain? Are, are there any things that I can do? Absolutely. I think, you know, a general exercise program, you know, it's, it's kind of all those things that we know to be right, you know, keep our weight to a reasonable range, um, perform some sort of physical exercise on a routine basis. Again, not muscle group specific or muscle group targeted exercise. It's just a global, you know, um, uh, health maintenance program physically. Yeah, just walking every day if you can. Sometimes yeah. it's hard to walk if you can't walk. You know. Swim if you can't swim. Yeah. Stationary bike. Um, One thing I would add to that too, you know, and I, I don't know how old that particular patient is, but you know, walking's great. But walking's also not everything, you know. And this goes to as the aged spine and you know prevention of osteoporosis you have to get some resistance across your joints. You know, you have to do some sort of strengthening exercise. It doesn't mean you need to go to the gym and, you know, bench lift a hundred pounds and do crunch it. And, but, but those resistance, resistance bands or something like that can be effective at maintaining bone density and, 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 you know, mobility of the joints. So truly a multifactorial thing. And I, I, 
my personal opinion is things to help protect your back are very common sense and it's just dedicating the time and finding the time to do it. I think some more, I'm just gonna add two quick ones. Shoes and mattress for me are a big deal because I have a pretty bad back in terms of just back pain. But I remember when I first started residency, I used to operate sneakers and felt crippled after, you know, an eight hour case. And I discovered Merrell's, you know, Merrell shoes, Dansko shoes also broke my back. It's all about how it pitches your pelvis, which then dictates your back angle. And so bad shoes cripple me, good shoes or really good shoes and a mattress. My wife once spun our mattress 90 degrees. So we were laying across the troughs because it was like a 12 year old mattress. <laughs> and I was in the worst pain ever for two weeks. And we flipped it back and it was gone. And so I tell all my patients, good shoes, good mattress. Not cheap, but sometimes worth it. And no smoking. <laughs> That's actually That's been right. scientifically proven. Actually, smoking does exacerbate chronic low back pain. This data is for that. We knew that smoking is bad for everything. Well, come, you don't have to be a doctor. To know that. Great question, so that's good. So, really, thank you guys for coming. And thank um, you. I know we didn't get to all your questions. I apologize. There were some other excellent questions there. Um, yeah. Again, if need be. Yeah, if you need, you can email them at the access line at kipgothealth.org, and we can see if we can get some answered. And if there's patients who are asking about how to get appointments. If you just uh, call our office, um, we'll be happy to get you in. I, you may need a referral depending on your insurance, um, but we're all seeing patients. Dr. Poole's not here tonight, but he, he's, you know, he's, he's available too. So there's the four of us in the office that can, you know, get you in. And ideally, it's nice to have an MRI scan before you come in, but if you can't, um, we can work on getting that approved for you. We also, we also have a nurse practitioner and two physician assistants that work with us that see patients. And certainly, you know, the four of us, um, want to convey a sense of empowerment to them because they're very smart, they're very capable, uh, and they have good judgment. Um, so sometimes, you know, patients may, I don't want to see it, you know, be it. They're, it, it's a foot in the door and uh, we live by the motto, if there's a problem, it will declare itself and we'll deal with it. So we, we do triage as well. So we look at the MRI yeah. reports and try to restack who needs to go when and where. Yeah. and realize a lot of people are hurting really bad so yeah but i second that, that nick's opinion that we have some excellent nurse practitioners and pas that can get things triage get things ordered and they know how to get mris approved better than we do honestly Absolutely. Um, that's true so thank you thank you thanks very much <laughs>